everybody. If I were to tell you about a car that had a glorious 6-litre naturally aspirated V12 making near 500 horsepower, a leather-clad interior, one of the most desirable badges in the business, looked like a coupe but still had room in the back for the family, you'd say that was a dream. And if I told you you could have one for the same money as an old Focus with a pop and bang map, well, you'd tell me that was simply too good to be true. And yet, courtesy of our good friend Depreciation, it isn't. This is the Aston Martin Rapide, and you can have one for less than £30,000. Question is though, should you? If you're clicking on this video, I suspect you know what the Aston Martin Rapide is. It's their four-door sort of Coupaloon type thing that was introduced in 2010 and survived in one guise or another until 2020, being actually the last VH platform car that the firm made. That is their bonded extruded aluminium technology, which sort of started with the first Vanquish back in the late 90s and then being released in the early 2000s. This is the same platform that underpins the likes of the Vantage, DB9, DBS and the later Vanquish. Though of course here it is stretched a bit to accommodate for a longer wheelbase and some somewhat more proper seats in the back compared with say the DB9, DBS and Vanquish. It was styled by Marek Reichmann, and though I've never been entirely in love with it, I have to say it does do an awfully good job of disguising its proportions. This is a car that is a hair over five meters long, so the same length as say a, a big 5 Series or a slightly older, smaller executive saloon, S-Class, XJ, 7 Series and the like. Yet, if you spot one on the roads, it does take a minute to realise that it's not a DB9, DBS, etc, etc. Now, I've actually driven a Rapid before, more specifically a Rapid S. That landed in 2013, after the model actually went out of production for more or less a year, when they moved it from Magna Steyr at Graz in Austria back to Gaydom, where you would have thought they'd have built the things. And I'm not actually sure why it was that Aston never built them themselves, but uh, anyway, they didn't. But suffice it to say, the car wasn't the runaway success that everybody involved hoped, and never during its life was this ever really a big seller even by Aston standards. Later in the model's run, it then evolved into the Rapid AMR, which was even more serious and hardcore. And if you're wondering how exactly to tell the difference between the three easily enough, just look at the front, where you'll find that these original cars have a sort of two-piece front grille, much like many of the other models in the lineup. The S then has one very large single grille, and the AMR a similar thing, but a little more aggressive. You can't miss those, and to be honest, you're unlikely to actually ever see one because they're really rare. And if you have seen my review of the S, you may recall that I wasn't actually in love with it. And for the benefit of those who haven't seen that review or who did see it and fell asleep halfway through, the reason for that is that to me, the only purpose of the Rapide is to have those back seats. You buy one of these because a DB9 or a DBS just isn't spacious enough. However, well, though you've got back doors, the rear seats are only just about more spacious than in the coupe. All right, maybe that's being a little harsh. I can sit in them, but you don't exactly feel like there's lots of room. And to me, a luxury car is all about space and airiness. This doesn't really have it. Now, this particular one is absolutely gorgeous in Mariana blue over a combination of sandstorm and um, 
another blue which I have already forgotten but it's spectacular I really like it and I don't even hate the wood in here which somehow feels more appropriate in a Rapide than it would in a DB9 or a DBS or certainly a Vanquish Oh, three-point turn hill start torture test. The natural enemy of any five-meter-long car with a three-meter wheelbase and no rear wheel steer. How do we do? Okie dokie, right. Visibility is actually okay. You've got a six-speed ZF Auto in here, which later during the S's run became an eight-speed ZF. Means for maneuvering, nice, easy, hill hold too. And uh, yeah does the job just fine. Not actually as hideous as I thought it was going to be. Having spent quite a bit of time lately in a great variety of Astons, I do appreciate some of the little rapid specific touches in here. These window switches, for example, are closer to those in the later Vanquish than they would be in an early DB9. You've got this center section here with a single cup holder, and then here you've got just a little cubby hole where you would normally get two cup holders that don't work that great in many of the cars. This also has a little rotary controller down here for a variety of different functions, and it even has an electronic handbrake, the first Aston to have one. And though the rest of it is maybe business as usual in an Aston Martin, that's a very, very nice place to be. And I actually remember the first time I went to get in the back of a Rapide, I opened that door and was immediately struck by just how small it actually is. I mean, I suppose that should be obvious because, you know, there's not much car for there to be much door. But even so, it opens a reasonable amount, but you've still got to kind of contort yourself to get in the thing, particularly for those like me with a nice long torso. And if you are playing the JM drinking game, now you have to down a shot. But you then get yourself into the back seat, you pull the door closed, I hit my elbow with the damn thing because it's so tight, and you do really feel like you're in a sort of fairly tight sports car cockpit, which would be fine if you were in the front of a car, but you're not, you're in the back. And some of these have rear seat entertainment and all that sort of stuff, but not all of them, and it just, well, it just didn't make sense to me because you didn't get the luxury experience in the back of a 7 Series S-Class, Lexus LS or even an Audi A8. And then when you wanted to have fun, it didn't drive like any other Aston, certainly not a DB9 and definitely not a Vantage. That was the car that's supposed to be better than this. But I didn't want to damn it before I'd driven it. And so I was very grateful when Matt got in touch and said, James, would you like to drive my Rapide, which at the time I bought it, was the cheapest in the country. And so, of course, I said yes. And now, for science, we better see what it's like. Today's review gets you headed towards the classifieds. Don't forget to take Car Vertical with you, the super powered super search that cross references a number of databases and plays automotive James Bond to give you all the information you want to know on any potential used car purchase, including previous accident damage, potential mileage discrepancies, involvement in fire, theft, or as unlikely as it might be, usage as a taxi. And I think if this was going to be a taxi, it'd be for a rather classy hotel. Anyway, for 20% off the service, don't forget to use my discount code, JM. And why would you go headed towards the classified looking for one of these if I didn't like it? Well, here's the funny thing. Right here, right now, I'm getting on with this car an awful lot better than I recall getting on with the S. Like that car, at lower speeds, it's still a little firm, not too firm, mind, and I have just gotten out of a McLaren 720S, which is actually very firm. More on that, of course, in that car's review. But once you get to about 40, 50 mile an hour or so, this does start to work. It has adaptive dampers, and I'm going to leave them out of sport, because if you press it, it just does that, jiggles you unnecessarily. Really, I think the car could have afforded to have been a little softer even still, and then sport mode, maybe halfway between the current comfort and sport. 
What I do have pressed though is the sport button down here, which chiefly dictates the action of the gearbox. Like I said, this is a six-speed ZF that Aston Martin branded Touchtronic 2. And it is exactly the same gearbox as you would have found in, say, my old DB9. Incidentally, formerly of dad cars. And if you would like to know what this car is like to live with as a parent, I am told by Matt that it'll soon be going over to Ben for him to do a review. So I'll leave a link to his channel in the description down below. Anyway, that gearbox, if you leave it in normal mode, it just wants to get into sixth as quickly as it possibly can. and means that even with that nice big chunky V12 and it's 443 pounds feet of torque, that's just over 600 Newton meters, it can struggle a little bit. Incidentally, this also makes the exact same 470 horsepower as my DB9, the facelift version with the nice glass key interior. These never got the older setup or the 450 horsepower engine. For the S, they then upgraded it to the second generation engine, which then had 550 horsepower. And that just felt, that it just felt a little bit underpowered. And I'm currently trying to work out what it is that has changed between now and then to mean that I'm currently enjoying the earlier and allegedly inferior car more than the supposedly superior S. And I think I've got an idea. It's two things, really. First off, expectations. When you get in the S, and it's got an S badge on the back, any model with an S on the back gives you an idea of what it's supposed to be like. It's supposed to be sporty, it's supposed to be agile, and people tell you that is the one that handles far better than this. Yet, though that may be true, I don't think the difference is night and day. They certainly made a lot of changes, including the fact that uh, the rear subframe in this is steel, like many other Astons, and in the S it's aluminium, which is nice. But overall, they're still fundamentally the same thing. However, I think it's got more to do with where I am driving these cars. Because you see, when I drove the last one, I was up on one of my favorite test routes in Scotland. And the thing with that is it's quite wide, quite open, and has potential for you to do reasonably high speed without all that much whizzing past your ears. Here though, I am in very English countryside with plenty of hedgerows to whiz past me and plenty of other roadside decoration too. That gives you an increased sense of speed. So even though I'm not going all that quick, I can assure you it's also not a particularly slow car. And the damping here also, okay, maybe it's still a little soft. It just seems to, to work a little better. But I do wanna check that first before I say any more. And on this section of road, I can. Excuse me a moment. Yeah, this actually really works. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, because it's the same engine, much like my DB9, this car's strength is in the mid-range, that sort of three to 5,000 RPM bracket. It only goes to about six and a half. This is no Ferrari screamer. And if you are absolutely intent on getting down a lane with four people in the car as fast as you can, a Ferrari FF is simply going to be the superior way to do it. But this is still not a bad way to do it. And the best thing about this car is you get to about 50 or 60 and the whole thing just works. The suspension begins to even out those bumps in the road, but you do then begin to feel that that's its kind of happy place and you don't really want to push all that much further. Like I said, there's no real benefit to be had from putting those dampers into sport mode. It just makes it an even firmer ride and I'm happy with how it performs. It's at that point you have to remind yourself this is a four-seater, two-ton executive car. When new, these were 140,000 pounds. And you may recall the Rapide from a very memorable episode of Top Gear where they drove four-door supercars. This, the Porsche Panamera Turbo and the Maserati Quattroporte. Now I've actually driven all three of those cars and owned a Quattroporte Sport GTS. That would still be my pick because I think it has really the most character. But this certainly has a far more special interior. Although it is still very disappointing that it's got the horrid Ford or maybe Volvo stalks that blighted all cars of this generation. 
I can also see that it's not the stiffest thing in the world because that camera over there is having a bit of an issue. Happily, and maybe because of it being built by Magnus Steyr and not Aston Martin, it also doesn't seem to be suffering the corrosion that most VH cars do. However, it is suffering from many of the glass panels beginning to delaminate. Uh, that's unfortunate. The exhaust valve is also currently wedged sort of half open, and it sounds fantastic. And I've got to say, I think that's probably adding to my enjoyment of this car. Although, I'm fairly certain this is not standard. I mean, maybe it is, maybe this is just how they were, but this is quite vocal, even for a car with the valves stuck open. Sounds more like my DB9 did after we did the primary decat. And as far as Matt is aware, that hasn't happened to this car, but um, he's gonna investigate at some point soon and maybe we will find something out. As to why he bought it, well, he's a lifelong Aston man. Astons are in his blood. His father has had a few of them over the years, including the likes of DB5s back in his younger day, then later things like the Vanquish, when they were all still a little bit more affordable. And he is one of many people that wishes he had held on to a few of those cars, but still he did get to enjoy them and certainly instilled in Matt a love for the brand. And though over the years he's had a variety of different cars, including even a couple of Monaros, it was always an Aston Martin that he wanted. But having a couple of children, now of 8 and 13 years old, a DB9 or similar, that was always going to be out the window. He actually tried a Vantage, okay, a two-seater, but was a little bit underwhelmed with it. However, with the budget that he had for a Vantage, he saw that he'd get one of these, which is a much later car. In fact, you'd struggle to get a DB9 of this age for this kind of money. Today, they start at £25,000, with really good examples being 30. And that's the other thing about this car. I mean, sure, okay, it's, it's an Aston. It's going to have pitfalls. They all do. Don't kid yourself, this is going to be pricey to run. But for once, compared with the competition, Maseratis, S-Classes, 7 Series, it's probably not going to be dramatically more than one of those. Sure, it drinks a bit of fuel, but it's got a 6-litre V12 in it. What did you think? And in all honesty, it's not actually hideous for a car so equipped. Budget, average economy around about sort of 20 to the gallon, and you're probably safe. And then it makes the noise. That could only ever be one car, an Aston. The steering also, apparently it's sharpened up a little from the DB9 to compensate for the extra wheelbase. And I've got to say, the feel here is lovely. This is something that I'm sure was missing from the S. Maybe it's a simple case of geometry, but this feels like I would expect any Aston Martin to. In fact, it feels at the better end of how I'd expect an Aston Martin. And I've driven a fair few lately. That S didn't. The brakes too, they're pretty decent, apparently also an upgrade, now a steel and aluminium hybrid, apparently to keep the weight down, although it still tips the scales at just under two tonnes, and that's before anyone sat in it. Of course, your RS6 owner is likely to be unimpressed with its turn of pace, but most other people, I think, should be satisfied with it. This is a car that's about how you arrive, not when. Again, like all other VH cars, it's actually on the narrow side, which is very nice and much appreciated on a road like this. Though, because of that bonnet, you do struggle a little bit to place the corners of it. I can do so, I think, really only through experience and having a vague idea of where these cars are and also cheating by putting a camera on the end of one. For somebody not used to this sort of thing, it could be a little bit daunting and uh, those parking sensors, very useful indeed. Response from the gearbox in manual mode is then good, if not great. Unsurprisingly, the same as in all of the other Astons of this era. And like those, I also don't like the fact that the paddles are so small. Very frustrating. Other companies learned. Aston did not. The car is currently sat on the original specification, though mercifully not the original Bridgestones. So when you do get it into a bend, if you put your foot down a little too early on exit, the traction control will light up, it will intervene, but doesn't hamper your progress too much. And I have to say, it's a fairly well-judged system. It's a good car, this. This car feels very much at home on these roads. 
And I have to say, I'm also quite impressed that it doesn't rattle at all. Apparently there are a couple that need dealing with, but honestly, I haven't heard them. All right then, in conclusion, I think my major criticism of the car remains. I think it's just an inherently weird choice. They tried so desperately to keep this styling they'd established with the likes of the DB9, although actually I'd say this has aged fairly well, they, they sort of compromised the whole point of the car. Those back seats are just not anywhere near as generous as in any of its rivals and in fact cars from several classes below. If you are used to being in the back of a Range Rover, you are not going to be happy in the back of this. But maybe if you are of that impressionable young age, those are the coolest seats on planet Earth. And maybe, just maybe, I have been getting it wrong the whole time. That's the point of the car. It always has been, that I know. But I've looked at it in the context of all of the other things that it could have been, that the dad could have bought. But he didn't do that. He bought an Aston Martin. And at £140,000, I would have said that he was an absolute loon. But at £30,000, and with these probably being a bit better cared for than not just other Astons, but certainly Merck's 7 Series and so on, might be a bit inspired. I do still wish they had made it a shooting brake though. First, I just love shooting brakes, and second, though this does have a little bit more boot space than in other Astons, it's still quite limited and a rather odd shape. And I do feel like, though yeah, cool, it appealed to people with really specifically aged or sized children, they did also miss out on a whole other market, all of the people that wanted a proper, proper four-seater. And to have this as your one and only four-seater four-door for a period of, what, a decade? <laughs> yeah. That was a bad idea, I think, Aston. But, <laughs> you know what? It's still a cool car. I still stop and look whenever I see one, and I am delighted that it puts a smile on Matt's face. So, there we have it. Aston Martin Rapide. I'm never going to buy one because it's a silly idea, but I'm glad that, that somebody did because if the world needs anything, it needs variety. Don't forget to hit that like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.